Well, hello and welcome to On the Horizon with President Pribinow. My name is Sarah Erkinen and I serve as Assistant Vice President for Institutional Advancement here at Augsburg University. I hope you are tuning in either next to a swimming pool today or at least from somewhere with really great air conditioning. Um, during today's event, you will, of course, hear from President Pribinow and you'll also hear from Jean Bay. She's the chair of our um, business department and she holds the Sunquist Chair of Business Administration. And we'll also hear from George Deerberger today. He leads Augsburg's MBA program. At the end of our formal presentation, we will have time for questions. You can be submitting those throughout the presentation in the chat window, or you can wait until later, raise your hand and we'll call upon you. You can share um, verbally at that time. This event is being recorded and closed captioning is available. Without further ado, I would like to present Paul Ribbonow. Thanks, Sarah. Great to be with all of you this afternoon. Thanks for joining us. I will uh, certainly uh, second her notion that you are someplace cool and healthy in the midst of this heat wave. I always like to start with this beautiful picture um, of the Hagfer Center for Science, Business, and Religion. Um, of course, today we have the chance to hear from Professors Bay and Deerberger about our remarkable both undergraduate and graduate business programs, as you know, um, situated in this beautiful building. I have to say that it's been a, a tough year. I've found myself wandering through the building on occasion just to soak it all in and, and uh, missing so much that kind of energy and uh, just the way that that building comes alive with our students. And as we are now planning for the fall, we very much hope that we will be able to um, be back in that building and using it uh, to its full full extent. So. So let me start uh, with the next slide here, just to give you a kind of quick sense of the arc of these last uh, uh, 15 months and, and looking forward actually to the next uh, 15 months. Uh, so as you know, a year ago, March 15th of 2020, uh, we all uh, faced the pandemic being kind of upon us and we needed to pivot quickly and uh, moved all of our classes online, uh, sent all of our students home, and, um, and then focused everything on trying to finish that spring semester as strong as we could, and we did. And we were able then to put together a virtual commencement uh, quickly just so that we could celebrate our students. But people work so hard, our faculty in particular, and our students who stepped up and just said, okay, this is not what I expected, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this work, and they did. Um, in the midst of that, we actually already then started the work for the uh, planning for the fall of 2021. Um, throughout the summer, the faculty worked tirelessly to take classes that, um, uh, have been taught for years, often in some cases face-to-face uh, -face, uh, on our beautiful campus, and yet knowing that the great majority of our classes were going to need to be used uh, using technology. And so meeting those challenges, trying to think about all the public health protocols that we needed to follow, uh, trying to understand how we could um, uh, make sure we were getting uh, students who needed to be tested, and once tested, if in fact they had the virus, what could we do with the quarantining and isolation? And we all became public health experts, I'm afraid, uh, in the midst of all that. But we made it through the fall. We, we were able to do some outdoor things earlier in the fall, and then uh, made it through the fall semester. Um, you know, went in a pretty tough time, as you recall, as we went into the winter, uh, or spring semester, rather, in January. We started to see the kind of uptick and things, but we still were able to kind of um, encourage students, uh, student athletes in particular, that if we had a short winter season, as you know, um, uh, we also then were able to uh, do uh, some fall seasons. I have to say it was very strange to wake up um, in April and look at the newspaper and see football scores from uh, colleges and you know, the ways that things got, got turned upside down. Um, but throughout, uh, then the vaccine started to become available and we started to see um, a move in the right direction and we ended our uh, spring semester at the end of April, had a virtual commencement on May uh, 3rd. But in the midst of all that, of course, with the way that some of the restrictions had been loosened, we uh, knew that we could actually do a, um, an in-person commencement. And we had promised our students, both from the class of 2020 and 2021, that we would do um, an in-person commencement as soon as we were able. So Tuesday night, a couple nights ago, uh, we had um, about uh, 400 or 450 graduates um, uh, from the classes of 2020 and 2021 and several thousand folks at US Bank Stadium. Um, and I just have to say, I've been reflecting over the last couple of days. It was very emotional for me. It's hard to be emotional in that building. <laughs> it's such a huge building. But but just this notion um, uh, that it had been 15 or 16 months since we'd been able to be together at that scale and just to see the joy uh, in our students' faces as they came across the stage to have their family and friends cheering for them. Um, 
Uh, it just uh, was a remarkable moment and just gave me a, uh, again, kind of a sense of urgency about getting back to that uh, because that's Augsburg and that's Augsburg Jazz Fest. So as we go into uh, this next year, a lot of work going on right now to get ready for the fall. Of course, with vaccination rates and things that we're seeing uh, very positive, we're really looking at getting back as close to what makes Augsburg a special place as we can in terms of our community um, in the classes and on campus uh, and in so many other ways in the community. The good news, and this is the next slide, is that um, in uh, October of 2019, the Board of Regents at Augsburg, and I think there may be a couple of board members on the call today, um, approved this strategic plan, which the community and had been working on over the previous couple of years. And what I love about this uh, plan is that it actually uh, helped to frame our work over these past 15 months, and it has framed the work we're doing going forward. And I think that's a, a powerful testament to the fact that we, we crafted a plan here that really um, uh, opened us up to thinking about what both make Augsburg special, what what really is unique, distinctive about us, but at the same time, um, you know, uh, it challenged us to think about what it meant to be relevant to, to the times. And if you look at that vision statement, I think that language in particular is just so powerful. Uh, we are educating Augies as stewards of an inclusive democracy engaged in their communities. And li listen to this, uniquely equipped to navigate the complex issues of our time. So think a little bit about the moment um, for our students as we send them out into the world or as we bring them to campus. You know, when you've got a public health pandemic and you've got an economic crisis and you've got um, uh, racial reckoning, all of these things, uh, climate uh, you know, change, all of that uh, together, um, you know, certainly in the intersection of those different uh, challenges uh, really represent those complexity that we've talked about here. So here we are called right back to this work that we do, what we're about, um, and then to think about um, what we were able to do in the context of the strategic uh, objectives that are there on the right to strengthen our three-dimensional education, to advance the public purposes of an Augsburg education, and to grow as a sustainable university. So I give thanks for this. Many of my colleague presidents that I've spent time with over the last year uh, had strategic plans that they had to push aside. We actually leaned into ours because, in fact, it offered exactly the framework we needed for the work um, that we were about and that we were planning for into the future. So if we go to the next slide, um, I think we've got, uh, yeah, this has got a lovely mosaic of uh, just moments from the year, just to kind of remind you of some of the things that we did. I go back up here in the upper left, and that's, uh, there I am out last summer, um, delivering uh, yard signs to incoming students. So, you know, we weren't able to bring them to campus for um, our normal summer orientation, so we went to them. Um, and we went out these signs, and it's so fun for me still to drive some of the streets in South Minneapolis and see those signs in the yards, uh, students made that connection they were proud to be able to promote that just got an email today we're doing the same thing this summer so I'm, i'll get my list of you know seven or eight uh, houses to stop by and so many of our faculty and staff joined that effort of course we did have staff on campus you see the enrollment services office there we as i mentioned we had athletics students actually practiced student athletes practiced most of the year we did a lot of outdoor events you see down the bottom left there some art making that was going on um, that's a picture of the, the uh, person with the face shield on there is uh, Dr. Alicia Quella, who was our head of our PA program and be, is also a, a PhD in epidemiology who became our great guide to this year. What a gift to have that expertise right in the midst of our community. And then of course you see in the middle uh, pictures there just a variety of ways in which our students, um, all of our students, faculty and staff participated um, in the kind of protests and, and really standing up for the things that they care most deeply about. And so just a quick picture of um, you know what we were able to do even in the midst of the pandemic to, to, to honor our sense of community, to, to keep our students at the center of our life. Um, and I'm just so proud uh, that we now have uh, come out of this year, I think uh, really positioned for, uh, for a real strength going forward. On the next slide, I think we have a picture of uh, some of the good news that we're seeing. Um, as you, were, this is a, our enrollment results as of uh, um, earlier this week, and you see there um, uh, on the left chart, um, those are the uh, deposits, what they call net deposits. So these are incoming first year students um, who, um, uh, who have told us that they intend to come and have actually made a deposit in that regard. And we are starting our summer orientations next week. So they will be start to come to campus in smaller than usual groups, but we will actually bring them to campus. So two years ago, as you know, at the beginning of our sesquicentennial year, 150th anniversary, we had the largest entering class in Augsburg's history. Um, that number as of this date in 2019 um, ended up at six, 35 or something like that. I think that was our class last uh, two years ago. Then last, that was the largest class in Augsburg's history. Uh, last year, 
uh, we at this date at about 635, we ended up at about 560. Um, and so um, second largest class in Augsburg's Bridge history. Um, this year we're right at about 611. Um, from what I'm hearing from our enrollment people, um, they think uh, we could actually beat last year. And that's what their kind of goal is right now is to beat last year. Um, you know, uh, it's very strange time because the deadlines that we normally would have in place haven't, uh, you know, we aren't really holding people to those same deadlines. We've seen student behavior change in terms of the kinds of things, um, you know, paying attention to deadlines. So we have been just continuing to work closely with our staff, but with the students and their families to help them to um, uh, make decisions. And so, um, so, and then you see on the right, uh, some of our transfer numbers, which are pretty uh, consistent with the last couple of years. So we're, we're feeling very good about this. This is a very positive news again. And think about this, our enrollment staff, admission staff did all this work kind of you know, on the phone, <laughs> basically, or on Zoom. Um, and so what they normally would not, would have done out in high schools and going to college fairs and the like, they weren't able to do, but they did all this work. Uh, virtually and still are seeing these kind of remarkable results. So very, very proud of them and very, very pleased to see um, see this trend. So um, on the next slide, I think we uh, talk about, just want to lift up um, some really amazing work that's gone on over this past year with our faculty, staff, our regents. Um, three specific initiatives that have really came to a close at the end of the academic year just, just to finish. Um, one was something called the Grow Sustainably Task Force. And so if you go back to that strategic plan, you see the third strategic objective is to grow as a sustainable university. So we set up a, a, a a, a task force that comprised uh, regents, faculty, and staff, um, and together they met between November and late April to come up with recommendations to drive our enrollments to new levels. And they uh, have four key action areas that I'll mention in a moment. Um, in fact, let's go to that next slide, TJ, and I can show. So there are four areas that they focus their attention on. Um, enhancing our distinction as an inclusive institution of choice for undergraduate students, improving undergraduate retention, growing and optimizing graduate enrollment and revitalizing offering for working adults. And there are specific initiatives under each of these action areas that we are now actually beginning to implement and fund. Very exciting work that's going on. Um, an amazing um, kind of just level of depth that they went to in their analysis of some of these issues. Um, I mean, this may, for those of you on this call, this may, uh, you know, really be a perfect example of how you take a strategic plan and you operationalize it, how you turn it into the work that actually um, allows you to achieve the strategic objective that you set for yourself. So um, there are specific metrics linked to each of these action areas. And then again, as I mentioned, um, uh, lots of initiatives that are going to allow us to drive this work forward. Um, on the next slide then, we see another project that um, Perhaps seems a little geeky, a little nerdy, maybe, but at this, I have to say, it's a huge um, kind of move for uh, for Augsburg, and I think in particular for those of you who uh, you know care about our business uh, program, you know that analytics is becoming a huge part of you know industries and corporations and like, and the same is true for colleges and universities, and so um, we are. Uh, implementing um, a, really a, a strengthening of our Office of Planning and Effectiveness that is going to look at how we can deepen the systematic use of data in academic planning um, and the tools that will be available, some staffing that will help us to do that. Uh, and that the key is that we look to the bottom uh, bullet there. How does this help us to cultivate an institutional culture of learning and results? Um, I think you certainly resonate with this. I mean, I, Augsburg is such a kind of remarkable place for mission-based and you know, purpose and caring and, um, you know, just community. And we want that, that is certainly critical to us, but we also need to think about how we are using um, good data, analyzing that data, and then using it to actually improve what we do. Um, and, and that's across all, all fronts, whether it's department by department and academically, whether it's across the administration. Um, and I think building that culture is what um, is really behind this particular initiative. And so this is a major, major move for Augsburg uh, in this direction. Then the final um, slide here that uh, talks about these initiatives is actually about a change in our, um, the structure of our academic programs. As you recall, we changed our name to Augsburg University. What has it been now um, four years ago? Um, and um, uh, we promised at that point to the board that we would do an analysis um, of how we could structure ourselves as Augsburg University in a way that best met the needs of our students. And so a good group of faculty have worked with Provost uh, Karen Kaibola over the past couple of years and have come forward now with this model, which creates a two college model. So we will have a college of arts and sciences and a college of professional studies. And then under each of those, there will be um, the different divisions. Um, um, and 
uh, it just really uh, it's important work because it, it really is about making sure that the people making decisions um, you know are those who are closest to the work um, and this is going to allow us to really uh, drive to that so continuing work on this this will likely be implemented over the next year or so and we will then um, be able to have an opportunity to to um, understand the difference this is going to make for our students and I you know this also creates uh, some nice uh, philanthropic opportunities. So any of you thinking about naming a college, you know, I've got two colleges for you. So uh, <laughs> you can't have Augsburg University, but you could have a college of art and sciences and a college of professional studies. So uh, also the possibility that there could be schools under these colleges. So a school of business, for example, or a school of social work or something along those lines. So just gives us those opportunities to begin to think, uh, I think about, um, how we take the complexity that Augsburg has uh, has really developed over this past uh, you know several decades and now kind of organize it so that we um, can be most effective and efficient. So, um, and then my final slide um, is just a reminder that um, uh, you know again for a lot of institutions they kind of pulled back uh, in their. Um, their fundraising efforts and uh, alumni engagement efforts. And I just feel like um, this Augsburg and its staff uh, and, and just leaned into this work, said this is, no, we've got important things to do and we need to tell people that story and we need to ask them to help us. And so just to think about some of these uh, remarkable um, achievements, a uh, hundred new endowed scholarships that have been created over the past couple of years. Um, we created a critical race and ethnic studies scholarship that was awarded for the first time last uh, fall. Uh, you see in the box, the maroon box here, the results from our Give to the Max Day. As you know, we've been the leading university in that uh, competition for the last many, many years. And this year we set a new record over $530,000 for 41 projects. Just think about that, 41 different projects from across the institution. The number of people then they've got a chance to bring their project to the table to, to help to promote it and then to, in the aggregate to bring these kinds of results. So, um, so, so, so very pleased with those results. Uh, we had a really great response from alums for the creation of a student emergency fund, which became very important during this year, of course, for our students with some of the economic challenges they had. Um, there has been the creation of this presidential strategic fund that uh, we've now raised um, uh, going on $800,000 uh, that is really allowing us to have the flexibility to respond to the most important things that perhaps uh, we need to seed in some fashion and we've not necessarily built it into the operating budget yet, but that has given me a lot of flexibility in uh, supporting some of those initiatives. And then I'm so pleased um, uh, the Augsburg Women Engaged, you know, we've had uh, issues of food insecurity for some of our students as well as for our neighbors. And that's been a real focus for Augsburg uh, uh, this past year on many fronts, but in particular, the Augsburg Women Engaged group that has raised money for our on-campus pantry, food pantry, that, which is called Campus Cupboard. So just for me, I think all of these are examples of people seeing what's most important and then um, wanting to be a part of uh, supporting it with, with their uh, philanthropy. And so I, I give thanks. And I know there are many people on this call who have joined us in these various efforts. So so with that, I think that concludes my um, ask part of this. And we'll come back uh, after uh, Jean and uh, George have a chance to share with you. But I'm going to pass it over to Professor Bay. Jean. Well, welcome, everyone. We have exciting news to share from the Business Administration Department. So um, uh, we're the first. The first slide talks about the mission statement of uh, the department, and the way you can simplify it is to think that we prepare students for practice. That's our motto that we use every day. We prepare students for practice. We want them to have practical experience while they're in school and after they leave. So um, one of the exciting things that's happened in the last couple of years is that we received ACBSP accreditation. And why is this important? Well, it's important because it's one of the top accrediting agencies for business schools. And even more importantly, it matches very well with the Augsburg vision. So it follows the Baldridge model, which stresses excellence in teaching. It's, it, uh, it, we, fo we focus on documenting student learning outcomes, a continuous improvement model. And we wanna, again, prepare students for practice by making sure that students have the skills that they need and the employers want by the time they leave Augsburg. So that is why we thought this was the right accreditation uh, program for us. It, it was a five or six year process. We're thrilled to have it happen and we intend to keep it for going forward. We think it will really help us make sure that our students achieve the skills that they need. One of the other things that we did was we set up a business advisory council. Here's uh, the people who are on it. So Susan Jamber, who is the vice president at HR at Spire Credit Union, 
Um, interestingly, one of the reasons we found Susan is that she was one of the chief people looking for interns. So we worked with people who were our alums who came through other agencies, um, but also uh, D Dustin Froyam is a is one of our is one of our alums. They have been very useful. Their job is to help support us and to provide external feedback. So if we think we're changing something to make sure it works right, we'd like, again, people in the field to say, you're on the right path. You should think about changing this. You should think about adding that. And we intend to make it a little bit bigger, but um, we don't want it to be too much bigger than 12 because then it becomes too diffuse and we wanna make sure that we're able to use the expertise well of the people who are on the board. Okay, so here's the organizational chart of the Department of Business Administration. So uh, Provost Cavola is at the top, right? Monica, Dr. Monica Devers is our professional dean. So I'm the, there, I'm the department chair. George Derberger is uh, the MBA director, works under my, um, I would say guidance, actually, he's probably guiding me most of the time. Um, uh, so we have, uh, here's our, we have, uh, we have hired uh, nine new faculty members over the last, uh, say, six or seven years. Four of them just achieved tenure. So, if you, uh, we're very proud of the fact that none of our faculty members have have um, only academic experience. All of them have professional experience. Sometimes years and years of professional experience. So. Um, George was talking earlier about our extraordinary accounting group. I, I, they, I call them the League of Extraordinary Accountants. They all have had 12 to 14 years experience working as accountants. They are doing a marvelous job. You'll see later on that our CPA uh, pass rates have gone up and uh, three of our new faculty members just achieved tenure. So I like to say that we took a strong roster of existing faculty and, and added in new faculty and we're all achieving great things together. I couldn't be prouder of my faculty. They are working hard to make sure that every area is um, keeping up to date and the students are obtaining the skills that they need. Okay, so. Um, and, and one more thing that the accreditation program requires not only excellent teaching, but requires consistent academic publications and presentations. So they are doing all the parts of the academic scholar that we want at Augsburg College or university, sorry. Okay. All right, so let's talk about the business majors at Augsburg. So marketing major is the second most popular degree. We have 140 marketing majors. Management major has about 100. And as I alluded to earlier, we had the second highest success rate for the CPA exam in the state. Some other small Lutheran college beat us by a little bit, but still, I'll take that. We, we beat out um, you know, the, some of the big giants, okay? Um, our, our MIS major, um, we're, uh, this is one of the things we brought to our business advisory uh, council. They are, we are gonna revise it to make sure that again, the, the skills that we're teaching our students are what's needed, right? Not only right when they leave, but also again, uh, knowledge is, is not a stock, it's learning for the future. So how do we prepare them to not only be ready when they first graduate, but in 10, 20, 30 years? We also have, um, uh, we, we've had, and we're continuing to update our, our business science, science minor and our entrepreneurial minors. And the entrepreneurial minors, I'll come back to that in a little bit. We have some exciting news. All right. So the innovation, so let's talk about the innovation speaker series. I know that Mike Nathan is on this series. We had a speaker every month from September to April. Mike Nathan from Fritz Finn, he's one of our business advisory council members, um, was, the, was a great speaker. He spoke for us in December. We also had two student alums who spoke in January about the work that they're doing to get their companies going. Um, one of them was uh, Sajay, um, and she's working on a chutney and Sam Ruiz, who's doing with Patenki Labs. And the students were really excited to see other students who were uh, in the process of setting up their own companies. And Mike, Mike Nathan has, is um, a, a co-founder of Turn Signal, which um, George will talk about later on. It's an important new app that we think will, will matter. Um, in terms of data analytics, 
Um, we also we added a, a data analytics component to the MBA, um, which has been very well received. We have a business analytics um, minor as, a, as an undergraduate, and we have been working with not only our department, but the math and computer science department, again, to make sure that students have the skills they need for the jobs that are there and waiting for them. In terms of entrepreneurship, we have the entrepreneurial minor, and there's actually uh, already an endowed scholarship called the Eastrom Scholarship which um, it was designed to have half of it go to students in terms of scholarships. We will start in the fall an inaugural group of Eastern scholars. And usually entrepreneurship um, is either undergraduate or graduate. We have been working with the Mayo Scholars Program for the last 15 years, which is a very exciting program where a team of undergraduate business and science students work with an MBA students. They are they are in coordination with Mayo in terms of either a new project or a new idea that Mayo is thinking of bringing to market. So we have decided to model our entrepreneurship program on that model. So the new Eastern scholars, four of them will be undergraduates and one of them will be an MBA student. And they will work on a project together either with a company, a neighborhood organization, or something to provide essentially consulting services or whatever that, whatever that group needs. So we're hoping that that is um, a first lead in. The other thing that um, we are interested in is we think that some of these students would be benefiting from mentors. And we're gonna start with this group. The Business Advisory Council is, has talked to us about helping us set up a mentoring program first with this group that we'd like to expand to other students later on. So we're excited. We think this is a great model. We're gonna focus on leadership helping people learn to be entrepreneurs regardless of whether they're working, whether they're working for a small company, whether they're working for themselves or whether they're working for a larger corporation. Just having the entrepreneurial mindset we think is important. So that's all part of the Innovation Center. The Innovation Center was set up so that, um, uh, again, small entrepreneurs, small companies could come in and work with groups, either from a, in a marketing class or an accounting class. And essentially, we would be like a consulting firm for these, for these small companies. And so that is also going to be part of the Eastern Scholars. In terms of experiential learning, one of the things that George and I did a while ago, which we think has worked out well, is we made internships a regular class because there's a couple of reasons for this. One is that especially first generation students don't have the networks to find their own internships. And we know from the literature that having an internship is critical to getting the first job, which makes a big difference in lifetime earnings. And also, I often tell students that if you, sometimes students go on an internship and they say, well, I thought I was gonna like that. And I hated that job. And I said, you know, that's okay. Because if you have two or three internships while you're an undergraduate, you look well prepared. If you have two or three jobs within six months of graduating, now you look flighty. So the time to discover that you, you thought you might be on the wrong path is before you graduate, not after. So George has done a wonderful job of helping students learn how to put the resume together, how to interview, how to get the internship and to move forward. And if you can see, when you look at the list of companies on the next page that we have placed students at US Bank, at Walgreens, at Augsburg in the accounts payable, that was an accounting student, of course, right? Lunds and Byerly's Travelers, and at the Minneapolis Airport Commission. And then, and then we had at least one music business student who was at Three Birds Music. So it's often the case that when students go out on these internships, then they get, they get job offers. We think this is critical. So um, we've, we've made progress at um, making that work. And also the student organizations, we have a couple of student organizations, the um, accounting club, the finance club, and the, and the Augsburg business organization. They have also made great strides to bring companies to campus so that the companies can showcase why students would wanna work for them. And then in the meantime, that enables them to meet our students. And so it broadens the, the, the range of opportunities that students think are available to them in various majors. And it, it also has broadened the number of, of uh, companies recruiting our Augsburg students. So we think that's a great success. Okay. All right, I think we're about to go to, oh, no, 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 
You know what, I uh, I think we're about to go to the MBA program. So I'm gonna hand it over to my worthy colleague, George Deerberger. Thank you, Dr. Bay. And Sarah, thanks for setting this up for us. Um, a couple of quick comments. One is thanks to Paul Pribonow and Jean for creating an environment and a culture that allows you to innovate and to pivot. And that leads to tremendous opportunities for our students. We, we believe at Augsburg that we change people's lives and we change students' lives so they have an opportunity to get a career, to buy a house, to buy a car, to have a family, to do all the things that we want as part of the American dream. And I don't think there's another institution in the Twin Cities that does that better than Augsburg University. So thanks, Paul, Jean, and the entire leadership team for that, um, for that tremendous uh, ability to, to change people's lives. Our MBA program is rigorous. We have uh, more quantitative courses in our core courses than any other institution in Minnesota, more than Carlson and more than St. Thomas. We've, we've added a lot of meat to the bone with our data analytics courses and also uh, uh, our concentration in analytics, entrepreneurship, finance, and leadership. We're very proud of that. We also use extensively Tableau in the MBA program, which is data visualization. So it's one thing to create the database and to look at the mega data. It's another uh, skill set to put that into a readable format where students can then present it to the executive team where employees can present it to the executive team for them to review and make decisions on. We believe in um, self-analysis. So there's a lot of uh, opportunity for students to do self-assessments, strength finders, IOPT and some others. So that's the art of being. As we get into the quantitative courses, it's the art of knowing. So increasing your knowledge base to start to think critically. And finally, the art of doing. And doing is the application where we really go out into the field. Every MBA student at the end of the program does a 580 field study where we actually help um, businesses and nonprofits write a business plan or a marketing plan or a strategic plan. So bringing it full circle is really important, but at the end of the day, Augsburg graduates are known for critical thinking. So here's the knowledge, now how do you apply that knowledge? And I think our, our students, our undergrad and our MBA students do a great job of thinking critically. It's one of our core concepts within uh, Augsburg University. Let's go to the next slide. On the next slide, you're going to see some of our partnerships that we've had for a long time. Mayo Clinic, as Jean mentioned, 15 years we've worked with their scientists and their business uh, departments to create business plans for um, new product ideas, new business opportunities, uh, strategic alliances. And it's been a tremendous program for us. We go down to Rochester, we actually present in Rochester, Gene went, went with us uh, two years ago to the executive team at Mayo Clinic. Just a tremendous opportunity for our students, both undergrad and graduate. Because of our relationship with Norway that Paul has fostered over the years, we were able to uh, create a relationship with Innovation Norway, uh, located in Oslo. We did six MBA projects for them in the last year, and they're primarily medical device companies that want to enter the US market. So our MBA students put together uh, business plans for all of those companies in Norway, and we're going to have more in the fall. That led to a relationship with the Norway house based here in Minneapolis. And we're now in the midst of doing two projects for two businesses, non-medical, that want to enter the US market. Really fascinating um, opportunities for our students. So we're on Zoom calls at 6.30, 7.30 in the morning. So we get them in the afternoon in, uh, in Norway. And finally, because of our relationship with the Mayo Innovation Scholars Program, we were able to create a relationship with the Medical Alley Association in Eden Prairie, and we just completed three MBA projects for medical devices uh, in the state of Minnesota. So we're giving back locally, we're giving back internationally, and that's a, a really great opportunity for us to market our MBA program, but also creates tremendous value for our students when they talk about this years later. Yeah, I worked on that project. That was a medical device we brought over from Norway. It's nice closure. On the next slide, you get an idea of some of the businesses we've helped locally, and this does not do it justice. I just, we only had so many, so much room for so many logos. 
but we've done over 120 MBA projects in the last 10 years, over 120. And not only do we do nonprofits like Recovery is happening down in Rochester, but also Habitat for Humanity, Valley Outreach in uh, Stillwater, which is a food shelf uh, and clothing, uh, St. Vincent de Paul in, in Minneapolis. We've done a number of breweries, a number of wineries. We've done a ton of projects for major corporations like Target, Best Buy, General Mills and, and 3M. We've kind of gotten into this little sweet spot with more entrepreneurial companies that are a small, medium size because we have more access to data and to financial information. So that makes it a richer experience for our, for our MBA students. We won't turn down Target or Best Buy, but it just works out really well for our students. Uh, and we all sign confidentiality agreements and do all those things. So I've got to be a little careful. But one really fun one we did two projects for was Living Green and they're growing lettuce down in Faribault uh, using LED lights indoors year round. And they can grow a head of lettuce in 28 days versus in the, in the ground, which could take 60 to 90 days. And that's been a kind of a game changer as we look at our impact on our environment and conservation and how we give back to, um, to the community. One I wanna talk about real briefly, if you go to the next one, is this wonderful company called Turn Signal. And my, our friend, uh, uh, Mike Nathan, who's on our uh, business advisory board, watched the killing of George Floyd and said, we've gotta do something about this. And so he put together a team he hired two of our MBA students, Andre Creighton and Michael Freelix, who by the way, have been best friends since they were four years old. And uh, they created this um, company in a matter of six to nine months. And it's an app that's on your phone that if you're approached, you're in your car, if you're approached by a police officer, um, you can live stream an attorney right there in the car. And, and so it keeps everybody, it de-escalates the situation. It's good for the police officer. It's good for the person in the car. Uh, this has received nationwide attention. Um, uh, the CEO, Jazz, has been on MS, MNSBC. And also in the newspapers, uh, professional sports teams are behind this, like the Vikings and also the Timberwolves. And this all came from an idea of Mike sitting there and saying, we've got to do something, man. This is not, this is not good. This is not right. And the result is a uh, company that just launched um, in, uh, in late May. So uh, you're going to hear, hear more about Turn Signal and some of the other programs that, um, that we've been working on as we um, do some additional stories on that for the Augsburg um, Magazine. So that's a real quick summary of the MBA program. And with that, I'll turn it back to President Paul Pribino. Thanks, George, and thanks to Gene and to George for uh, just a remarkable work that's happened over the past decade. And I, I had the, I always have the privilege at our spring uh, Board of Regents meeting to bring forward um, faculty members who are receiving tenure and being promoted. And we had, uh, we had actually had four. Uh, of, the, of those from the business and economics department this year, uh, including the three that uh, Gene mentioned who joined us six years ago and uh, uh, one in accounting, one in finance, one in marketing. So showing that, uh, and then uh, Dr. Lori Lohman, who's been with uh, the department for a long time is also uh, in the marketing uh, area uh, was, was actually promoted to full professor. So, um, so the business uh, economics program got a, a lot of attention from our board members uh, with lots of good news there. So um, we're grateful for, a remarkable, and this accreditation uh, that that is a that is a huge lift. Uh, and let me tell you, these folks <laughs> they deserve a lot a lot of credit for making that happen. So um, so thank you both. Um, if you have questions, uh, you know, again, as Sarah said, the chat's fine. Um, yeah, here we got uh, Sarah. You want to? Yeah, it looks like um, questions are starting to come in. Um, Rob here is wondering how he can volunteer with Augsburg. And I think any one of the three of you could probably answer that in various ways. Certainly, you could. Um, I can connect with you, Rob. I think that would be great. And then um, got opportunities all over campus in lots of different ways. So, <laughs> so. and uh, you know, mentoring uh, students, coming and talking to a class about your own experience. I mean, just one, all kinds of. You know, you know, we can set the bar at whatever level is appropriate for you. I think in terms of your engagement. So. Oh, looks like uh, Mike Nathan has his hand up. Mike, you want to share your question? 
Certainly. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. <laughs> Good. So I thought I'd raise my hand instead of interrupt like I, I usually do on these. So uh, thanks for seeing the hand raised. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Primanel, uh, great to meet you virtually. I just wanted to maybe not ask a question, but I'd offer a comment about the, as, as the non-Aggie on the, on the Zoom here from St. John's, um, my involvement with the turn signal and with, with, uh, with Gene and George uh, on the business council, when I was uh, thinking through how to find a, uh, a business college that represented uh, uh, people of color, um, looking for a diverse group of, um, of entrepreneurs to help lead Turn Signal. I sent three emails to three other universities and George and Jean answered with less than 24 hours asking to learn more. One responded back a, a, a week later and I still have not heard from the other one. So it's, it's, it's um, not only are I think the team walking the walk, um, you know, others are just talking out there saying they want to do something. When there was an opportunity, people did step up. And so I want, want that to be recognized, one. And then two, think about other ways. This is where the question is, how else can proactive, knowing how to engage with the market when, when, the, when, the, <clears throat> when the market says, hey, I need talent, you can, you can immediately snap your fingers and direct them to the right folks or the, you know, and vice versa as, as you guys are looking for opportunities. So that was maybe my question is how to do more of that experiential learning. Um, also to, to be ready when somebody calls, when somebody does ring the bell, you can do it. I, gotta, I, I think I was talking to George and Jean within two or three days of sending the email, which is again, amazing. So uh, thank you for the inclusion. And then my two Augsburg guys, they're not even my guys, the, my teammates, they are, insanely great and good humans for for real there you go yeah. well yeah thank you mike i i um you know i think you you picked up something about the uh, uh augsburg culture here i mean you know this is a place that uh, it itself is entrepreneurial in so many ways that i i think you know that kind of t seeing an opportunity and responding and 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 this is a place that is so radically student-centered. I mean, you've heard it from Gene, you've heard it from George. I mean, you could talk to faculty across the entire institution. They want our students to be successful, um, and they go out of their way. I, I remember the music program, the former head of the music program, you know, um, uh, Dr. Bob Stack, who, you know, had played drums for Prince or something along the way. He, he had our music students out doing gigs all over town because he had those connections. He used those networks and those connections to make that happen. So. Um, so I think uh, you've really you know, hit on a very important aspect of it. Now, I would say a couple of things. I mean, uh, the experiential opportunities, especially the kind that Gene and George have pointed to, um, uh, they've really got to be educational opportunities, and that's the key. I mean, I think that that's the work we're doing now, strengthening those 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 uh, experiential education is something that's been baked into Augsburg's history, uh, especially over the past 60 years. And we take it very seriously that when we send a student out into the world, they're going to have an experience that teaches them something. And so for that, mentor or that supervisor also to understand themselves as an extension of our faculty becomes an important part of the pact we make with folks. Um, you know, a couple ways that for those that are on the call that uh, we do, of course, you can go directly to faculty members uh, like Gene and George, but we do have a Strauman Center um, for Meaningful Work, which is our career center, and a, a Lee George, who leads that, is just a phenomenal uh, young professional who is working really hard to build a kind of network of businesses and corporations that and, and other opportunities, we have a great relationship, um, for example, with Travelers Insurance, um, where we've set up a program where our students actually can um, get a scholarship, they can also get an internship, they get some mentor help, they get kind of a shadow curriculum about uh, that, that, that industry. Um, and we're actually using that model to set up relationships with other industries. So we have a relationship with Fairview, um, M Health Fairview, um, around a similar kind of opportunity for students to get that on the ground experience alongside of getting support for their education at Augsburg. So um, that's a good opportunity there. Um, we have a question here actually from Tom Howe, and I think maybe this, that Gene, you could probably answer this. He's wondering how, um, how prevalent is that ACBSP accreditation? There are about 1,200 campuses, and I want to point out that it's not just campuses in the U.S., it's an international group. So there's about 1,200 campuses that have accreditation. And okay. so, um, and 
there's uh, two or three more inside uh, Minnesota, but we're proud to be members of that group. Okay, so there's only a few in Minnesota who have that accreditation. That's right. Okay, thank you. Um, and while we're waiting for any other questions, I'll maybe ask one that uh, I've heard on previous calls like this of Paul. Um, people have often wondered uh, how we'll support vaccination efforts. Will it be a requirement for any of our faculty, staff, or students as we um, come into the fall academic year? Paul, do you want to address that one? Sure. Yeah. Well, that is the, the question of the hour uh, for not only colleges and universities, but lots of organizations. Um, so we have um, made the decision so far that we won't mandate, but we are going to uh, work very hard to make sure that our that the huge percentage of our population are in fact vaccinated. And so we've actually set in motion a whole variety of efforts to do that. So we've done a survey of faculty and staff and we have remarkable results back already where we know that um, uh, more than 95% of our faculty and staff um, are already vaccinated. Um, so that's pretty good. Um, didn't have to mandate that. Um, we are actually also gathering data now about our students and we're getting some really good results back. We, um, we have an opportunity to use the state's uh, inoculation record system portal and we can send our student names there and then they match for us and tell us. And so we are very pleased with where uh, what those initial numbers look like. And then we've joined, uh, the White House has put together a campus challenge um, to encourage colleges and universities to, in fact, um, work on lots of fronts to get their students vaccinated. So we are part of that and are employing a whole variety of means to, as we'd like to say, to uh, inform, um, encourage, and support. And, I, and we think for our students in particular, um, given the makeup of our student body and where they come from, you know, there are some challenges. So there are some barriers sometimes. It might be that you work during the day and you can't get off work to go get a vaccine. Maybe, um, uh, maybe there is some cultural issue. And so what we're actually gonna do is zero in on exactly how we can help a student to get a vaccine. So, and we've got two and a half months here before school starts and we are actually almost down to the you know individual student now thinking about reaching out and what can we do to support you, to help you? Um, what information do you need? What, uh, and we've been opening, we're next, so, next week, as I mentioned, we have our summer orientations happening. So we are doing uh, vaccine clinics on campus while those, those entering students are on campus. So they're not gonna have to go anywhere else. They're gonna have an opportunity to get the Johnson & Johnson one-shot vaccine right there at our summer orientation. So things like that, that are the ways that we believe are culturally the right way for Augsburg to move. And, uh, and we're gonna track in the data and we'll, we'll see where we are um, as we get later into the summer here. But we really do believe what we're seeing so far would give us a sign that um, we're gonna be able to be back uh, very close to normal uh, activity um, in the fall. So. Well, I'm not seeing any other questions um, coming through the chat uh, or any hands raised. So, Paul, do you want to make any final comments for the group? Well, let me just uh, say that um, um, I know some of the, see some of the names out here, and uh, I know many of you I've uh, talked to along the way in other settings. Um, I, you know, one of the things I just want to be clear about is that you know, this has been a remarkably difficult year uh, for everybody. And certainly, you know, if you like this, this, this pandemic was very democratic, you know, it affected everybody. Um, but in particular for um, our students and for our faculty and the work and our, our staff, especially for those who are essential workers. And what I just want to say is for those who are on this call, who are alums and friends, um, I'm so grateful for your continued interest in what was going on, your continued support, uh, if it was what you were called to do if you, for your prayers, because they helped, <laughs> all of that. Um, we really uh, feel like, um, you know, this all, wider Augsburg community had our back and we really uh, are grateful for that. And so, you know, these on the horizon events have just been our way of uh, staying, kind of keep in touch with various groups. And, uh, and I really am grateful for, uh, for all you're doing to, uh, to support and advance Augsburg's mission. So, um, and I wanna say thanks again to Gene and George for their great presentations and for all their good work. Fun to, fun to hear it. So, um, all right. Well, thank, thank you all. You. Stay cool. Good. Thank you. Thank you.